Welcome everybody. Good morning, good afternoon from everyone joining in from different parts of, of the world uh, today. I'm Tracy Cooper, I'm Chief Executive of Public Health Wales and I'm delighted to be moderating such an important session uh, for the next hour and a half. So we're going to be covering what is such a topical uh, theme for all of us as National Public Health Institutes as to how we can integrate health equity into our climate and environmental actions. So just before we start, and I invite our excellent speakers to take us through their words of wisdom, if I can remind you that you can speak and listen in English, French, Spanish and Portuguese. All you have to do, if you look to the bottom of your screen and click on the interpretation button and select the language that you want and just go back into it if you want to revert back to English. And I'll ask each of our presenters, please, at the beginning of your session, if you're going to speak uh, in, non, uh, in non-English, if you can just let people know what language you're going to speak in so that can help them go into that translation. We will be recording the session and we'll also be sharing the PowerPoint slides on the website after the event. And please feel free to make comments in the chat bar and you may have questions as well and we'll save those until we have the broader panel discussion after our presenters have finished. So embedding health equity in everything we do, as I've mentioned, is just a core now, I think, for all of us as National Public Health Institutes. And COVID and the challenges that we've seen through COVID have just significantly exacerbated our underlying inequalities and exposed new vulnerabilities across all of our nations across the world. And it's also highlighted how interdependent individual health and well-being, social cohesion and the economy are in how we drive and transform population health in each of our countries. So climate and environmental action not only provides a focus on tackling the challenges of health equity, but also provides such a huge opportunity for all of us to innovate and transform health over the coming months and years. So we have four excellent speakers over the next hour and a half, and they will be covering the breadth of health equity, of climate change and environmental action. So I'm gonna move on now and less from me and more from our wonderful speakers and introduce our first speaker, Ingrid Stegman from EuroHealthNet. So I'll hand over to, to Ingrid. So thank you, Ingrid. We can see your yes, slides. I can see, you could see me and not hear me. I apologize. About we can hear that. you now. Perfect. Okay. And now, so, um, well, good morning. <laughs> I was saying I had some technical difficulties, and I think the energy of that is still with me, but uh, now it's, uh, I'm glad this is going much more smoothly. That was earlier in the week. But, um, but I will be speaking about uh, putting health equity at the heart of measures to address climate change. Um, I don't think anyone here needs to be convinced of the need of that. Um, I think we all know um, that the less and the least um, uh, fortunate among us tend to suffer more from, from the consequences well, of all uh, um, factors affecting health, including climate change, but then tend to benefit least from the, the measures that we tend to put in place to address that. Um, the challenge really is to, in moving from, um, from the rhetoric to the actual action and, and doing something about it. Um, and I'll go a bit more into that um, by telling you a little bit more of, about who we are and our work on health inequalities um, for those uh, beyond Europe. Um, and then going a little bit about, uh, we work in the European context, so about the, the, that policy context that we're working with. 
uh, in and what they're doing, and then um, focusing a bit on what the National Institutes of Public Health um, can do, because we just had uh, another meeting on this um, earlier this week, in fact, amongst our members. Um, so we are a European partnership for health equity and well-being. Um, we have 61 members in 26 European countries. Um, most of these members, uh, many of, of the full members are also National Institutes of Public Health in Europe, but there are also some ministries and as well as regional and local authorities and research bodies um, amongst our um, members and associate members. And health inequalities is really a cross-cutting theme throughout our work um, that aims to improve health and well-being for all and really put this on the European agendas. Um, I stole this picture from Oliver Scholl from the European uh, the Agency for the Environment and Health who spoke at uh, the meeting that I just mentioned that we had, just because I think it illustrates so well um, how our way of life uh, is really undermining um, our health and well-being and that we need to do something about that. And that really... Um, uh, came to our awareness about 10 years ago, we took a part in a project um, that looked at sustainable lifestyles for 2050. And that project inspired us to coordinate, to design and coordinate our own project um, that was called Inherit, that looked at, because there's so many ways we, we could see how addressing environmental concerns really also improved health. Those two things are hand in hand. We also wanted to look at this question of equity. How can we, um, find this, sorry, the, this triple win. Um, so, uh, and, and try to skip, find initiatives that address a triple win, improve the way we um, live, move and consume in ways that both uh, restore the environment, promote health and promote equity. And how can we multiply and scale these initiatives? So this, uh, in, in, in the context of this project, we looked in the area of living, we space energy efficient housing, um, moving, active travel and active lives and um, consuming. So food production, consumption and waste. Um, and essentially we found that, you know, finding this, these links between uh, these initiatives that improve health and well-being um, uh, or, or health and the environment is quite easy. Um, but when you try to put in that equity element, it becomes um, quite challenging. And this is because, as I said, people who are less off generally have uh, a lower carbon footprint, but suffer more um, from the consequences of environmental degradation. The cost of many measures that benefit the environment and health um, are much higher proportionally for those um, on low incomes. Um, we just have to think about the carbon uh, emission taxes um, that led to the Gilets Jaunes movement or the fact that yeah, uh, having a healthy diet is much, much uh, um, more expensive proportionally for those on low incomes. Um, and then the financial incentives, incentives that encourage people to adopt more sustainable lifestyles um, uh, are generally designed to benefit those who are better off. Um, so it's really crucial to address the underlying structural causes of, of health inequalities. Um, and um, well, I could also show a lot of slides <laughs> uh, on you know, the potential impact of climate change on the gradient, but uh, at, uh, we are involved um, in the joint action on health equity, um, bringing together a lot of ministries within Europe and that just ended actually um, at the end of this month or this <laughs> last month, November. Um, and Michael Marmot, so my professor Sir Michael Marmot presented there and showed how the gradients in health in a lot of different, for a lot of diseases corresponded very much for the gradient in the impact of COVID. And uh, no doubt those gradients will be exactly the same um, once these impacts of climate change uh, start becoming clearer. Um, so we all know those gradients. I'm gonna skip over these two slides um, and just, jump into um, the EU's initiatives on climate change because um, uh, you know, one, one important thing is to embed work with current policies and, and what is a good sign is that there are a lot of policies right now at the EU level out there that are very much focused uh, on, on this issue. Um, it's the first of uh, the Green Deal, is the first of uh, the Commissioner von der Leyen's Six, this commission's uh, six policy priorities. 
Um, and it of course sets out to make Europe the first climate neutral continent um, by 2050 and reduce net greenhouse emissions um, by at least uh, 55% by 2030. Um, the Green Deal really covers a wide range of areas and strategies, some of which have to do directly with climate action, um, like the climate law, um, and many uh, initiatives that really came out that came out um, this July that really put intentions into law, uh, mainly around emission trading and and um, deepening um, some of the the legislation around that. Uh, there's the climate adapt strategy, but then there's also a lot of other strategies that will have an impact uh, on climate change, like uh, air initiatives in building and renovation, sustainable mobility, eliminating uh, pollution, the farm to fork strategy, um, and the biodiversity strategy, for example. Um, this is just to say there is a lot of money <laughs> in going into this and a lot of funding available. But then getting back to really the key question of this uh, meeting and webinar, uh, what does this mean for, uh, for equity and, and solidarity? Because there's also a big emphasis uh, in the Green Deal on a fair and just transition. So again, there's specific funds um, that have been made available uh, really to ensure that um, the more vulnerable people within Europe, more vulnerable countries, um, do get some extra support and extra funding to help make this transition. Um, and, and for example, the Climate Fund, the Innovation and Modernization Fund, um, the Just Transition Fund. But um, at your health net, uh, during the course of the year, we had some interviews with our uh, members to see um, how they thought this money could be, the money particularly in the resilience, the recovery and resilience funds could be spent to address the issue of um, health inequalities. So a lot of this money has to be spent on climate change. How do we mainstream the health inequalities into that? Um, and if they knew if their countries were going to spend money in ways that could help to reduce health inequalities. Um, and many suggestions were made about the way that the, these funds can be spent that would be in line with the funds um, in relation to, um, for example, uh, supporting healthy, health, investing in healthy, creating healthy environments in um, primary and community care, measures to promote mental health, improving monitoring and surveillance systems in countries um, that, but generally it was found that the, uh, um, there was apprehension as to whether this money was really going to spend in ways that be spent, whether equity was really a focus here. And for example, um, one of our members that we interviewed was surprised that uh, there was no specific flagship area tackling inequality. So it's a general objective, but then when you go into the specifics and the guidelines being provided to states, um, they don't really uh, uh, show guide as to how this money can be used to also um, uh, generate, generate greater equity or um, promote uh, solidar solidarity. So in terms of the meetings that I just mentioned uh, at the start with our members uh, to find out what they were doing to address health inequalities, um, there was a discussion that we need to advocate much more um, for a fair transition and advocate as in also uh, work with other, uh, so for, advocate for these kind of guidelines really to make um, health inequalities a pro much stronger priority um, and not just kind of the, the add-on uh, of course, and also we want to reduce health inequalities. Um, but this of course does uh, entail being a bit more political, um, and that's within a lot of national institutes of public health, um, there's some tension there. Um, but I've added these two links because it's, uh, it, it's a very good overview or a little synopsis of how, you know, this should be, was always inherent to public health work. Um, but we, uh, public health community moved away from this a bit and towards the biomedical uh, approaches. But in the context of COVID, it's quite US focused, but it's really relevant. These are two relevant articles by Ed Young in the Atlantic um, that 
uh, that stressed the importance really of taking up this advocacy role for public health. It's inherent to our work. Um, the, our members also raised the, the need um, to collaborate on common messages to feed into the next WHO ministerial conference on climate change and health um, that's taking place um, uh, to, to make sure that this really reflects what we as a, a community of uh, institutes can do and the commitments that we want to make and we're, are willing to make. Um, the issue of investing in local uh, eye level initiatives that really engage local communities um, also came up as a priority. So really the local level are really umbrella settings for health and we should be working there uh, again, or this is really around the issue of co-creation participation that really happens at this local level and is so important to addressing health inequalities. Um, working together to develop common indicators so we can really track and measure uh, what is happening, how, how climate change is affecting um, the, across people, across the socioeconomic gradient that can be used again for these advocacy purposes, essentially, and, uh, and, and to take action. Um, and another area that uh, they, they members were working or felt they could work together on, with, uh, on this was to build capacities within the current and future with current and future public health professionals. And there's, for example, um, as for um, the Association for Public Health in the context of the um, uh, health policy platform uh, initiative, uh, EU level initiative to bring together different actors has is going to set up a thematic network uh, on this topic that, uh, that um, we and our members uh, is one of the areas that we can contribute to that. So these are some of the things that came up in our discussion um, on what the National Institutes of Public Health can do. I also wanted to flag that uh, this, that you heed the joint action on health inequalities that just ended has uh, now, uh, there's a lot of information out there, including a statement um, on what uh, public health public authorities can do to address health inequalities. And it's again, really the main, you know, nothing surprising in here, but really driving it, prioritize this uh, um, and uh, really create, um, uh, 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 apply really um, an, an equity lens um, throughout and, and not just wherever and whenever possible <laughs> is really a key, um, key, message and, and not just message, it has to be really put into practice. So that's, uh, and, and particularly also with, you know, climate change, which is in the medium, well, we thought medium and short term, and we've seen now the immediate term really are perhaps the greatest, greatest threat to our health. So I will leave it at that because I'm sure there's a lot of good follow-up uh, and I'm very interested also to hear what the input of the other speakers. Thank you so much, that's a perfect, starter for us. I think you've, you've covered all of the, the challenge. I think your last comment of, around the immediacy of it, I think is, 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 is particularly pertinent. And some of the points I took, um, that whole gradient, that, that um, overlapping gradient around COVID and the impacts of climate change, the importance of, of local, uh, local communities and engagement. And I think perhaps a point for us to have a discussion on when we join the panel is the is our role as national public health institutes around advocacy given the politics of health equity i think that's a really interesting uh, interesting area so i would ask everyone please hold your questions for ingrid and we have the the broader panel um at, at, in, in a at 20 minutes or so so thank you ever so much ingrid so i'm now have the pleasure to introduce tatiana marufo from the national public health institute of mozambique so thank you ever so much tatiana Thank you so much uh, for the invitation and thank you for the opportunity to share uh, Mozambique experience. So can you all see my screen and move on? We can. Could you pass? Oh, brilliant, perfect. Thank you, Tatiana. Okay. So, um, my topic for today, uh, Okay. 
So I'm going to talk uh, about the challenge and perspectives of the climate change and health equity in Mozambique to share uh, the experience of the Instituto Nacional de Saúde of Mozambique. Um, so this is outlined in my presentation and I'm going to start by introducing, introducing. So Mozambique is a country vulnerable to the adverse impacts uh, of the climate changes and it geographical location accounts for this vulnerability. So um, projections of climate indicates that Mozambique will experience um, increased temperatures, delayed start of the rainy season, and an increase in terms of frequency and intensity of the extreme weather events, which will place an additional pressure and challenges to our sector, so to the health sector. The Instituto Nacional de Saúde of Mozambique, so INS, is showing uh, its commitment to this uh, climate and health issue from uh, five to, to, to six years, uh, from the past five to six years. So if we are talking to Mozambique, we have to talk about the impact of climate change in our country. So I'm, I'm bringing here these charts in which I want to share uh, that uh, the extreme weather events in our country. Um, the, the, the extreme weather events, so historically, are very variable along the time in our country, and it's dominated by drought, floods, and tropical cyclones. So I'm showing here the trends of the, the events since 1980. And uh, what I'm showing here is that denotes a significant increase in the number of uh, cyclones, as you can see, 21 cyclones from this period, and uh, also uh, floods, uh, 20 events of floods uh, in this period. So uh, from 2009, we have more events related to tropical cyclones and floods, and together with a reduction in terms of draft episodes. In terms of diseases, I must say that in terms of burden of diseases, uh, it's dominated by the communicable diseases, especially the, the diseases that we are called like the climate sensitive diseases, such as malaria, diarrhea, and cholera, which represents a, a major public health concern in our country. So moving uh, uh, my slides, I must say that um, the period that I, I was talking about in terms of uh, the 1980 until 2019, we had registered in the country around 12 episodes of drought affected the country. So um, only in 2015 and 2016, severe drought that we had in the country affected more than 1,050 hundred million people in the country. At the same period, we have like 20 events of floods affecting the main uh, uh, watersheds and the, the, the episode that the affected more people that we have in mind is the floods that we registered in 2000. Around 21 uh, events of cyclones affecting the country in this period and affected all the Mozambican coast. Only the cyclone Idai, uh, as you all know, it was uh, categorized as a, a, a four of, of a category four cyclone, struck Mozambique on the 14th of March, 2019, affected uh, five provinces with heavy rain, severe flooding and devastating winds. Around 1.85 million people were affected and we had registered an official tool uh, of dead of six, 103 uh, uh, people from uh, the impact of this cyclone. So let's talk a little bit about our experience as the uh, Instituto Nacional de Saúde. So we are committed to the advocacy in terms of climate change and health risks and impacts in a sense that we uh, have in mind some of the meet meetings that we have uh, organized uh, within the country. I must uh, mention, for
for example, the workshop that we organized for the health professionals uh, for the awareness of the impact of climate change on health. We organized uh, uh, in 2017 the first public health debate on the impact of climate change on health, in which it was possible to create awareness in terms of, uh, of climate change on the health sector. Uh, in about in around 150 people that we had in this meeting, and we had the opportunity to have uh, the former minister of uh, the health and even the minister of the environment in this meeting. Another meeting that we organized it was the workshop for communication of health information uh, on the health sector for the main stakeholders. So another experience that we have and we created. Uh, within INS, it was the predictions on the health sector. And we started in 2018 through the National Observatory of Health uh, with a dedicated platform to climate, environment, and health. In this platform, we use uh, the data uh, from the Met Office forecast for the next rainy season. And we are able to produce risk map uh, for malaria. We started with malaria only in 2018. And then we move forward with uh, malaria and all even diarrhea disease risk mapping, as I can uh, show you in, in this uh, figure here uh, uh, above. So uh, this evidence that we are, are uh, generating through the National Observatory of Health are being included in the National Hano uh, Contingency Plan for the management and reduction of the risk disasters for the following rainy season and cyclonic season also. So this is one of our actions in terms of contribution to address the health inequalities uh, resulting from the impact of the extreme weather events. So other experience of INS, it is that um, in 2019, a vulnerability and adaptation assessment, so a VNA of the health sector to the climate change was conducted. And this is a, a assessment that uh, results from the exposure which relies on the climate uh, factors and variables and even the extreme events as reported in the country. We have also the sensitivity in terms of system and risk uh, demography and vulnerable population and even health. And for adaptive capacity, we rely on and variables related to the health uh, for the human resources and budget for health, for the access to the health care or health services, access to the wash, and even social determinants of health. Oh, so it was possible to have um, the, to determine the health vulnerability index for the, each one of the districts of the country. So as a result of this assessment, we have that 40, 42 districts out of 161 showed a high to a very high uh, health vulnerability index, uh, which represents 31.8% of the national territory and accounts for 24.1 population of the country. Eight districts were uh, had registered a very high he uh, health vulnerability index, HVI, and 15 of the 20 least vulnerable districts are urban, around 75% of uh, the districts. So with this analysis, it was also possible to, to, to determine, so in terms of vulnerability to the drought, to the floods, and even cyclone, which represents uh, the, the exposure of the country to, to these extreme events. So as you can see, this is another action of the INS contributing to provide evidence uh, regarding uh, uh, the health equity among the country. So INS is also committed in terms of contributing to the generation of evidence in sense of uh, it, is, it was possible to improve uh, some of, the, of understanding in terms of process of adaptation uh, to the climate change. For example, um, the relationship between the communicable diseases and the climate factors, we have published some, something around, uh, about this. Uh, even the impact of the extreme events on the disease outbreaks and how to respond and manage to, to such emergencies, the role and responsibility at different levels, and even at what level it's 
needed for public health decision to act. Other experience that we have within INS, it is in terms of response to the emergencies as part of a health, health sector emergency uh, response cluster for the impact of the climate uh, related events, including uh, actions such as develop and implementation of uh, health information frameworks for emergencies, development of early warning systems for diseases, field epidemiology, and even outbreak investigations. Another action is to monitoring and evaluation of the health situation during and after the events. So other experience uh, that we have within INS, it is the commitment to the education and training. So we uh, um, uh, had opportunity to include climate changes and health issues in, top, uh, in the post-graduation courses as a package of one health module facilitated by ANS qualified technicians. So the programs that I'm talking about is, for example, the field epidemiology uh, master program, the public health master program, and even the public health specialization program. So in terms of perspectives, um, this, the, the INS uh, is uh, aim uh, to implement for the implementation of the climate environment and health research agenda. So we are currently in the process of validation of this agenda that we have uh, developed and we have prioritized around 48 topics of, of research for, 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 for this thematic area. Uh, so in a way that we can promote the use of evidence to action to prevent, to reduce, and even to compensate environmental health inequality. Another perspective is to monitor environmental health risks. So we are uh, uh, in the process of establish and, and installation of sentinel sites for observation of climate and health. Uh, and we aim to expand to the procedures that uh, may include social, spatial, and even environmental dimensions. Another perspective from our hand is to assess vulnerabilities in the healthcare facilities so that the facilities could be able to anticipate, to respond, to cope, to recover from, and even to adapt to the climate related, uh, related stress, and even bring ongoing and sustained um, healthcare to their target populations despite the unstable climate. So another perspective is to contribute to the awareness and the education. So continue doing this, but now through lectures and trainings to doctors, to healthcare practitioners and other relevant healthcare professionals so that they can take inequality in risk exposure into account when making decisions. Um, other perspective of INS is also to support the health sector on the implement we are talking about plans like the national uh, determinant contribution and even the health national adaptation plan that we are part of the plan and we are had the opportunity to contribute on it. So as my conclusions, I have that um, INS is, is been doing a lot uh, and its contribution uh, contributing a lot in terms of health environments and populations in Mozambique. Uh, taking into consider in consideration the roadmap for action in terms of climate changes, we think that we are uh, contributing to the monitoring evaluation, although from our hand, and more capacity should be acquired to conduct actions to measure the benefits of the national uh, based solutions. We are contributing also to promote, to protect and to educate uh, and we think that more commitment, commitment and actions are required from our hands in terms of promoting health environments and lifestyles. And we also uh, um, contribute to respond and facilitate action, but we are uh, well aware that a multidisciplinary based intervention is still a challenge while we are addressing health inequalities. So I, I think I will stop here. And this is all that I have to share with you. And thank you again for the opportunity. Uh, Tatiana, thank you so much. That was quite a tour de force.
uh, thank you for sharing all of the tremendous stuff that you're doing in Mozambique. There's such a lot of learning. I was struck with your presentation, even for Wales, there's so much we can learn from you. And clearly already climate change is having such a significant impact in Mozambique. Um, how are you captured in your presentation, how you're really bringing together the uh, relationships between climate change and communicable diseases and how you're planning and anticipating that and what your response and interventions are. I, I think it will be very interesting for, for everybody joined in. And also, I, I really liked what you were saying about building a One Health approach to education and training as well. So some really powerful messages in that. And I'm sure there'll be lots of questions and comments. So thank you. Thank you very much. A really, really helpful presentation. Uh, and again, please keep your, your, your questions and your comments coming and we'll, we'll showcase all of those in the panel discussion. So we're now moving on to Brecht Devlashawa. Apologies, Brecht, if I've mispronounced your name. And uh, Brecht is from the CSANO in Belgium. So thank you very much, Brecht. Yeah, thanks a lot for uh, the invitation. Um, as mentioned, I'm Brecht de Vleeschauer. I'm an epidemiologist working in Cienciano, the Belgian Institute for Health. Um, and I'm part of the Health Indicators Unit within Cienciano, a small but growing unit that aims to make best use of available health data to quantify state of health and health inequalities in Belgium. Uh, and today I'm, I'm happy to present a relatively new project, uh, which is the ALICE project, um, aiming to monitor and mitigate environmental health inequalities in, a, in Belgium. Um, in the past, we've mainly been focusing on looking at the current situation and historical trends, uh, but more and more in our unit, we want to look at the future. So how will the health state uh, evolve over time? But also what can policymakers do? What are the options for policymakers to um, have a positive influence on the, the future? state of health. So this project aims to contribute to this objective, uh, specifically in the context of environmental health, uh, with a main focus on mobility related um, pollutants. Uh, so the objectives of the project are twofold. We want to study the extent, extent of socioeconomic differences in environmental burden of disease. So how important um, are these uh, inequalities? Um, and we also want to develop a, a policy relevant tool that can allow the stakeholders to uh, continuously assess the impacts um, of policy measures, not only on the extent, but also on the inequalities in environmental burden of disease. Um, and as you can see on the right hand side of the slide, it's a collaboration between different partners, both within uh, our institute and in uh, academia. So the essence of our project is the definition of the concept of environmental health inequalities. Uh, and a bit to our surprise, this is a, a concept that is not yet uh, often used. It, it's not yet fully defined even, um, but we define it as the integration of three uh, key components. Uh, that is information on environmental stressors, such as air pollution, information on health outcomes, such as all cause mortality or asthma, and information on deprivation. Uh, what is, of course, very common is a pairwise integration of uh, two of these uh, elements. So, for instance, combining deprivation with environmental stressors would give you information on environmental inequalities. Environmental health is the integration of environment and health. And, of course, integration of deprivation and health is. Uh, the concept of health inequalities. Uh, but we want to combine them all at once, uh, leading to the concept of environmental health inequalities. So this means that integration of data is a, is a key component of this project. Um, and we have uh, opted for an approach where we want to combine uh, the data at the level of the statistical sector. And in Belgium, the statistical sector is the smallest uh, administrative uh, geographical unit. Uh, there are close to 20,000 sectors in Belgium, each having around 1,000 or less uh, individuals. Um, so the first steps of the project are to 
obtain information on environmental stressors, health outcomes, and deprivation um, at the level of the statistical sector. And then we um, will combine this information in a, in a number of steps. Uh, in the first step, we will integrate information on the environmental stressors and the health outcomes, uh, giving rise to estimates of environmental burden of disease. So, for instance, the number of um, deaths associated with air pollution within a given statistical sector. So this is done based on a comparative risk assessment methodology using uh, population attributable fractions calculated for each uh, sector. In a next step, we will then integrate this information on environmental burden of disease with information on deprivation. And this will allow us to calculate a number of inequality indicators, uh, such as um, relative and uh, absolute differences, uh, population attributable fractions, concentration index, uh, et cetera. And in the end, so this will be our definition of environmental health inequalities. The, inequality, uh, the social inequality observed in estimates of environmental burden of disease. Um, throughout the project, we want to uh, respect a number of guiding principles. As mentioned, we want to work at statistical sector level and not at individual level. Um, one of the reasons is that this would allow us to uh, avoid some, uh, some privacy issues, would make it a bit more flexible and easy to work on this in a sustainable way. Another key concept, which has been the focus of the first year of the project, is the uh, development of an index of multiple deprivation. And this is new for Belgium. It's not new for other countries, but in Belgium, it's a, it would be a novel concept. And building on uh, knowledge translation and sustainability, uh, making sure that we can uh, interact with our policy stakeholders in an optimal way and that we can develop a tool that is that can be used um, also after the end of this uh, specific project. Uh, the project itself um, is led by two PhD students. Um, the first one focuses on uh, the aspects of multiple deprivation and health inequalities, while the second student works on all the aspects related to uh, the environmental stressors. There's also environmental burden of disease and the environmental inequalities. Um, it's, as mentioned, a project that has uh, recently started. Uh, we are in the first year of the project, so we don't have a large number of final results to, uh, to show, but I can show you some preliminary results and uh, give you an, an idea of what uh, the future of this project will bring. Um, so one key element of the project is to develop an index of multiple deprivation in Belgium at the level of the statistical sector. Uh, we have, of course, been inspired by similar indices in, in other countries in Europe and uh, beyond. Um, and for our index, we will select uh, or we have selected indicators linked to these six uh, domains, employment, income, crime, housing, education and health. Um, and we have uh, integrated um, the different indicators into a single index of multiple deprivation with uh, corresponding ranks and uh, deciles using methodology that is also common for other, other indices of uh, multiple deprivation. Um, some snapshots of the, the results um, that we can obtain with this index. So here we have for males and females um, an indication of um, how the um, overall mortality um, is associated with the housing domain of the index. Um, and what is evident is that individuals belonging to the, the most deprived sectors in terms of, uh, of housing conditions, that they uh, systematically have higher rates of, um, of mortality. And this is especially evident for males in the uh, in the adult age, uh, also for young children, this, uh, this is quite evident. So again, this is novel for Belgium, but we believe that it will give us uh, a very valuable and powerful tool for this project, but also for many other projects where inequalities uh, play a role. Um, the 
second part of the project then will aim to integrate the environmental aspects in the um, in the approach so looking at environmental inequalities environmental burden of disease and then also the inequalities in environmental burden of disease uh, we will be looking at a number of um, environmental stressors so the classical air pollution indicators but also uh, road noise green space um, ozone etc so these have been mapped at the level of the statistical sector um, which then also allows us to uh, dive a bit deeper in the uh, spatial variability of these environmental stressors so it allows us to look at co-occurrence and clusters um, of stressors uh, but then the final aim will be to calculate environmental burden of disease environmental inequalities and inequalities in uh, environmental burden of disease. Um, I'm unfortunately not yet able to show you any of these results, but this is a, a schematic um, yeah, overview of how the approach will look like. So we have our estimates of um, the environmental stressor at the level of the statistical sector. We also have our estimates of the health outcome at the statistical sector and per sector we will be able to uh, integrate uh, the two and quantify for instance uh, mortality attributable to uh, to nitrogen uh, based on the the classical population attributable fraction uh, formula um, and in a final step we will then uh, link this back to the index of deprivation to see whether um, more deprived areas have a higher uh, burden attributable to, uh, to environmental stressors. Um, a final component of our project will be to implement um, health impact assessment models. Um, we have chosen for um, a mitigation model related to mobility uh, in, com in consultation with our stakeholders, of course. So we will be developing a number of transport scenarios and then modeling that through towards expected exposures. And if in, in our approach, the exposure will change, then of course also the environmental burden of disease will change. And we will also be able to look at the impact on uh, inequalities in environmental burden of disease. Um, and this aspect of integrating inequalities in a health impact assessment model is actually quite novel. Uh, there aren't that many examples of um, health impact and inequality assessments. So we hope that with this project, we can also set the scene for, uh, for similar activities in Belgium and beyond. Um, okay, so as mentioned still a, a long road ahead of us um, but i do think that this will be a very important project for our institute because we will build on something that we can continue to use for uh, many different topics uh, so the belgian index of multiple deprivation um, we hope to be able to publish this uh, early next year and then our next steps will be to continue the different activities and uh, to develop a series of online visualization tools because the, the presentation of the results is a key element in our uh, knowledge translation strategy. Um, if you want to learn more about the project and follow our progress, then you can also always have a look at our website. Uh, we also have a, a series of blog posts written by our researchers, so they then give you some additional insights in uh, in some of the specific elements of uh, of the project, uh, but you will also find more general uh, news updates. Um, and I'm of course happy today to uh, answer any questions that you might have on uh, on the project. So thank you very much for the invitation and for your attention. Thank you. Red, thank you so much, and thank you for presenting something that is obviously very complex in a really clear way as well. Uh, I think we're, I'm sure many of us uh, across the world are, are grappling with how we build these data sets to really inform health equity. Um, and we know for, in Wales, we've been looking at trying to gather the evidence around health inequalities, and there isn't that much evidence globally around what works uh, for health inequalities. So having these tools, this, this data uh, to enable us to, to do proper research and to learn 
I think is really key. And, and I just wonder, um, uh, Duncan and Catherine, Jean-Claude, uh, Louise, Juliet, whether there is an opportunity perhaps uh, for IANFI to, to do some coordination um, because I think there, there are a number of us as, as public health institutes who may be doing similar work around health equity and it would be great to actually share some of the tools or the concept of them that are being developed with, and perhaps uh, an opportunity to share them more broadly when, when we've, we've concluded them. So thank you, Brett. I think re really fascinating dimension and um, bringing the data to the conversation. So thank you very much. Uh, again, thank you. We've got questions coming in. Uh, thank you, everyone. Keep posing your questions and comments uh, and we can, we'll, we'll showcase those shortly. So our final uh, fantastic presentation uh, this session is uh, Guto Galvo from Fia Cruz. So, Guto, over to you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. So, let me uh, put my screen sharing screen up. Okay, well, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity. Uh, I will speak in Portuguese since it's not very common for Portuguese speaking have that opportunity to express ourselves in our own language. So uh, the slides will be in English, but I'm speaking in, in Portuguese. I just want to check if the translators get my um, my my sound right. I, I received some message before they are in problem. They are in problem. Please let me let me know. So um, I was asked to talk about the uh, the inequities and uh, all this uh, during the COP15, which was held in 2009 in Denmark, in Copenhagen, where I I, I was uh, have the chance to attend, and the COP26 as in Glasgow, the last Glasgow COP meeting. Um, in in the in the 15th session of the COP, the conference of parts of the UN. Framework Convention for Climate Change. We already knew that polar bears are dying around the world. So climate change is really causing a lot of problems. I switched to Portuguese now. Também nós sabíamos naquele momento, já tínhamos informação. We already had the information regarding how this worldwide scenario of uh, climate change would impact environmental means such as air pollution, uh, the different uh, phenomena of extreme heat, and how this would also cause issues in health. This was already well known and discussed at the time here. Uh, we had uh, different uh, groups discussing this topic and in the context of a WHO, but also in other countries. This is nothing new. This is something we knew for some time. We are also knew this map is a map that is very referred to and well known uh, from our colleague uh, Pats from the University of Wisconsin, where on the uh, upper part we can see uh, the proportionally the size of the countries in the map. The size of the countries on the map will show the emission that these countries have had in terms of the contribution to uh, climate change. And on the lower part of the graph, the consequences of uh, climate change. What are the countries that will actually suffer the consequences? And you can see that many of the countries that uh, most most contributed to climate change are actually not the ones that will have the worst consequences in health. This was something that is well known to all since uh, 2009 in COP15. And also at, during COP15, we can see that these are outdated data, um, but this, so you can just update this in the uh, Health Observatory at WHO. These are data from um, 2004, which were presented in 2011. Uh, and these were the so-called dallies uh, per 100,000. And uh, in terms of uh, diseases that are attributable to climate change, uh, globally 84. And uh, in detail, the countries that have uh, a low to middle income, you have 278 and uh, the uh, high income 1.6. So this is an immense difference, a brutal difference when you see that map and numbers in these uh, figures that are uh, uh, interim numbers, and here we have to consider all the work that is done uh, behind this and something that our colleagues before me have already referred to. And um, during COP15, developed countries made a promise, a commitment that 
in the next years, they would uh, do uh, long-term investments, make uh, resources available in order to protect and help developing countries that were suffering the consequences of climate uh, change. They would give a 30 billion in the period of 2010 to 2012, and then they would mobilize a long-term finance of a further 100 billion up to year 2020. This was a commitment made by developed countries and maybe one of the main, if not the only, uh, or major uh, positive results of uh, the Copenhagen COP, which was a, uh, a COP that was expected to be the uh, greatest uh, agreement and that then we would actually, this would actually happen in Paris in 2015. This paper presented by Jocelyn Camplin is a very interesting um, uh, article played recently on uh, Nature and I do suggest you read this. She made this analysis of what happened with this evolution, this progress. And what we see here is that the promise, the commitment was not fulfilled, not one year since uh, 2013, which was this uh, chart when she started studying. And even when it was met, it was met with some areas of some gaps, uh, you know, for, in, for instance, in governmental programs that there is no control to make sure that these commitments are made. She also prepared this other chart, quite interesting, I think, where she forecasts what are the countries and their contributions and, and proportionately. So how much should be expected as a contribution from each country with regards with the total amount of the 100 billion. And we can see that there is an important uh, gap here between the countries and also uh, in terms of how many of these were actual grants, donations, and how many of these were loans and that uh, financing that should be paid in the future. And we see that no, none of the countries that could have uh, made a greater investment met their commitment, some more than others. And still, when we talk about 100 billion and we talk about these amazing, impressive figures, and we look into the financial need of environmental change, we're talking about a very small portion, actually, of what actually is needed for climate finance. Today, we're talking of about uh, 6 trillion, which would be uh, the actual necessary amount. And here, we're still talking about billions. So even though it seems like an amazing, outstanding figure, comparatively speaking, to the uh, investments need so that we can uh, reach the so-called 1.5 level, uh, we are still far from that. And uh, just to give you an example, this is a very well done assessment made by the US by a multi-agency group participating, I guess, if I'm not mistaken, 13 uh, grant agencies. And they develop this research process of uh, impact of global change, including environmental change and including health. This uh, table here, I'm not going to go into detail, but it just is a reflection of what I projected before. It's uh, the, from the CDC and the consequences that were considered in this newsletter as a consequence of a climate change. They're very similar to what my colleagues previously mentioned. Uh, you have uh, uh, air pollution, floods, uh, vector-borne infection, uh, and uh, the outcome of what was uh, projected by them is a result that really uh, calls our, draws our attention to it. This is, this is the number of fatalities in 10 years, and so we can see it's a very high number. And here, the amount of the cost for each one. So you can see that in 10 years, approximately, this was the uh, deadline that was used for this report. The total cost was of 500 billion. And this is an annual cost of 50 billion for one country that we know of, uh, that for which we have good data. I'm not sure in Europe there are also this kind of calculation done. So 100 billion for everyone in uh, developing countries. It's also a number that we have to maybe rethink. Not much about the number itself, because of course it's uh, sometimes it's uh, too high for certain countries, for certain countries' uh, development stage, but what we need in order to deal with health issues. Uh, Here is another interesting data as for the knowledge uh, that we have when we talk about climate change. This is been recently published by this uh, magazine 
climate and development in the editorial section, knowing that a thousand influential scholars had in climate change published in Reuters. That was important because this gives you an idea of the relevance around climate change. But they were dismayed to see that only 122 of them were women and at least and only 111 on the list were based in institution in the, of the global south and 88 were from china so this leaves for the rest of the developing world the global south only 23 scholars publishing for a public health institute is an important information for us to think strategically about our partnerships. So this is another very interesting information. This was published in the Nature uh, Partner Exchange. A number of papers that have been published, a little similar to the objectives described by our Belgium colleague, urban transport, food, industry, building, and projected the impact of demand of these sectors when it comes to well-being. And in order to make this comparison, they used the sustainable development goals of climate change, the SDGs, they use SDGs, climate change SDGs, which you see the columns of the various SDGs, food, air, water, health, sanitation, energy, a number of uh, indicators of the uh, 2030 agenda. You can see that in health, that's the most repercussion when you have uh, increase in all the sectors health is what best reflects well-being as well as air and others but the idea here is to show you how complex uh, the methodology is to study these health issues the uh, was interesting in the ellis project from belgium is showing that there is a development methodology that can be shared as mentioned by our colleagues during the COP26, first of all, there was a main shift in attitude. And I think the best piece of, piece of news from COP26 was the participation of the civil society and the focus of civil society when it comes to the clock ticking in terms of urgency, this became very clear. And also the problem has become uh, a w uh, disseminated. Another issue that came from COP26, the increase of the relevance of health as part of climate change. The first time in, COP, in the COP, conference that was a specialized session on health and we ha I Amphi had a session uh, there was the launching of the um, Iamphi climate change initiative so a huge number of concrete commitments a health sector commitment to improve emissions in the health sector with uh, 46 signatory countries. I think today this number has gone up to over 60, the commitment on the part of IAFI, thinking the uh, strategic role of institutes. And so I think these are two very important news. The other good piece of news that came from Glasgow was the inclusion in the very first paragraphs of this point where it's as when implementing mitigating and adaptation measures, uh, it needs to be uh, obligations 
with human rights and rights to health, as well as native populations, local communities, and so on. Everything that has been mentioned here today, this is very important when it comes to the health sector, because this is a, an assumption. If you're going to do something about climate change, let's look at the right to health. So this is also critical. Another important issue was the inclusion of the payment compensation addressing loss and damage associated in a developing country that should be receiving. It's not part of assistant for assistance for adaptation and mitigation. It is a reparation, it's compensation. So this has increased. This has gone beyond going from help and mitigation adaptation as part of the process where everyone is having the same share, but also help in compensation for losses uh, perpetrated by someone that has some sort of blame in the process. And with uh, the uh, Copenhagen uh, commitment of 100 billion per year, this is a concrete commitment. And this is great help in achieving equality, equity. This is what I had to say. I hope that this is a good fulfillment of the topic that I was asked to speak about. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Guto. Um, I think that was a perfect uh, last presentation because you brought us right back up to those global disparities. Uh, and I think some really sobering content in your presentation, particularly looking at all of the commitments and the gaps that we are accumulating in what's being committed at various points in time and at various fora uh, and, and the, the, the significant distance that we've got to go. I also thought your climate finance universe, really powerful chart. I mean, that just says it all in the gap of investment. And I'm, I'm sure we'll come on to having a discussion on that as the panel. And I think your, fine, your, your latter part of the presentation talking about the health, the contributions of health such significant not only around the circular economy around the foundational economy but also for climate change so thank you very much i think you brought all of that back up to the the, the global challenges so um, i'm going to ask all my colleagues to put your cameras back on uh, for our, our presenters and and uh, excellent presenters give, have given us a, a really strong breadth um so we've got some questions uh, that we have from the audience um so i'm going to start with uh, Felix, I know had a, a conversation uh, with Tatiana just about the importance of the economy in developing countries as a major cause of environmental uh, changes, particularly around you know, creating the right conditions and the relationship with communicable diseases. So I just, and I, I know you had a conversation, but I'd be interested in the panel's thoughts about how do we ensure that the economy is at the center of how we tackle climate change, particularly with our engagements with our governments. So who would like to go first on the panel? Maybe I'll come to Tatiana because you and Felix had that uh, conversation. for the question, uh, Philip. Uh, this is something that um, it's, a, it's a concern in our country, especially with the expansion of the, the mining industry in, in Mozambique. So Mozambique is uh, some sort of uh, El Dorado nowadays. So a lot of, uh, uh, of mining industry are coming to explore our resources and with serious impact, I know that uh, this is uh, very uh, important in terms of impact on the environmental and even as, uh, 
uh, impact for the health sector. So, uh, as a concern, this from Mozambique, so uh, we are uh, involved in some of uh, the projects uh, in the country which are um, working in the environmental health impact uh, assessment uh, in this uh, at this end uh, with the involvement of the government of Mozambique, so the Minister of Health and different kinds of institutions, uh, including the, the Institute National Code. And um, I think we need to provide uh, uh, more uh, evidence in terms of the impact uh, in this specific uh, topic. And that's why I answered uh, uh, Felix, and thank you for your question again, that uh, with this research agenda that we are developing, developing at the moment, we, we have topics in this regard, and we aim that we have the opportunity to implement our research agenda starting next year. And we want to provide evidence of this topic and, and even to provide uh, uh, information that can uh, be used for the decision makers in this regard. Uh, this is what I can answer for now. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. And thanks, Felix. Felix was just uh, contributing to the conversation about particularly the, the, uh, the importance of and implications of the extractive economy, thinking of forestry, mining, et cetera, and the impact that has. So thank you. Thank you, Felix. Um, and just to just to say to Louise and Juliet, I can't see people's hands. So if you want to let me know if someone's got their hand up uh, to, to speak, that will be what well, will be great. Any other comments on this, this point from panel members? So Ingrid. Yeah, I think it's such a big question <laughs> that I hesitate. Uh, but the thing that comes to mind is uh, economy of well-being. You know, I think it, it's why I, I mentioned and focused in my presentation on the inherit uh, that, that really brought us is how we came into the really positioned ourselves in this this domain of health and environment um, and equity and and with inherit it's a bit where we ended up and that's been taking off to this concept of economy of well-being and um, and that comment of you know why health professionals we need to be advocates because in the end, we need to change the way we're living, moving, consuming. Uh, um, no, people don't like or adapt. And there's a lot of money again <laughs> through all this funding, resilience and recovery funds through COVID, which is so closely linked, you know, and <laughs> how these, uh, um, what's, what the situation we are in now. I think I, I didn't mention, but when it was also interesting when Inherit ended, you know, and really opened the eyes of those of us who were there, but I think the world's eyes are now opened into that COVID hit. And it was, you know, we knew there was this chronic crisis. And as a colleague said, that's the, now we're in the acute crisis, but there are two crises that are very linked and showing we need to adapt. And, and I think the vision, one of the slides I jumped over, one thing is we need a positive vision of where we're going, because one thing we learned in Inherit is doomsday scenarios just don't motivate. Uh, behavior change was also one of the cross-cutting themes in Inherit. And if you keep putting doomsday scenarios, people just, you know, it, inherently it, it just doesn't work. And this idea of we need to move towards more well-being and health, that's our role, that's public health. Um, and that's why we need to be um, advocating and showing also the evidence is incredibly important, but but we can't get stuck only in the evidence. It's you know, this is the here and now, we can't wait. <laughs> so, so we have, you know, I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing Sir Michael Marmot and, and all the others, we have the evidence to act uh, enough. There's more that needs to be done to, to mainstream, uh, to develop the structures, um, to keep that course of action. But we, we do know health inequalities exist and we know we need to, so, so our economies need to take, you know, we need to build economies around this. It's, it's so central and that's what's doing, but again, it's, are we taking that seriously in terms of is this being looked at and how we're being invested? So I put in the comment also health impact assessments. You know, it should inherently be with an equity lens. That's part of the definition should be in the classic definition of health impact assessments. The fact that it's not being done is, you know, for those of us in this field, it is almost you know, shocking, but it's the reality. And how do we make that an inherent part? Because it's it's all of our health, if, you know, again, the, the, the evidence by Wilkinson and, and uh, Kate Pickett, who shows that you know more equitable societies are better for everyone, and that's part of resilience and where we're trying to go to. 
Exactly. Again, huge topic. <laughs> so, yes. But. Yes. And it's how we present the evidence as well, isn't it? Just Martin, Guto, you've got your hand up as well. So thanks, Ingrid. Guto. Uh, you're on mute. Okay, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. So it's just to, to make some comments and participate in this conversation, very important conversation. Thank you, Ingrid. I think you made a very good point and you know how this, about this exactly. It's not, a, we cannot stop on this. So we need to act on it. And then, and this is basically, uh, I think in any um, industry in, in uh, work, is a, is an important example of how systematic, uh, you know, um, process make the difference and in causing inequalities and causing environmental problems and the results in, in the worse in the problem, not working better. So I think we need to really act on the systematic process. So how you can, it's the same thing that we talk about the real systematic systemic racism or at the same time when they talk about you know prejudice for determined for some populations or, or problems with immigration this is all the same it's this process we need to act on process i i want just to mention uh, a colleague uh, frio from the university of austria australia who is working exactly on the governance because i think there are a, a very important work to be done on governance how we can change governance there are a huge opportunity now with this uh, treat being discussed in WHO. And there are many information they might need, you know, about governance that is really helping to change the process. That's not out there. We don't have the enough uh, evidence for the process. We have, we have been measuring, you know, indicators in an epidemiological way. So we know the difference, we know the numbers, how much dies here and like that, but you don't really have the uh, information about how this process helped and how we can change the process. I think that was uh, really very, very important. Um, there are also one question here, and I want to, to, to the, about the indicators. If there are anything that the field epidemiology training programs can do about the indicators, I just want to mention the countdown from Lancet, which I think is an excellent initiative where every year there are a set of indicators that's put together. And one day in the year, we all take a look together where we are with climate change and health. That's a Lancet uh, initiative, which I think is very, very helpful, both on the, how the process is going and also how we can measure that and, why, and where is the indicators. Thank you. Guto, thank you very much. Um, really important points. And you've moved us nicely into the, the question I was going to uh, broaden out to the panel as well. We've both, we've got Patrick and Mathilde who've asked similar questions and thank you for picking up on that. Is, is this whole thing about, is there consensus and perhaps where would we get it and perhaps what we think the role of IANTFI is around the set of climate change, health impact measures and indicators. So yeah, Guto started us off on that. I'd just be interested in other the views of other panel members on this this area. Bess, could we maybe come to you? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I have a, a clear expertise on this. Um, so maybe any of the other panel members would be better placed to, uh, to reply, sorry. Oh, that's great. I can see the overwhelming enthusiasm for the panel to put their hand up on this question. Okay, well, maybe I think, oh, Tatiana? Sorry, I'm not sure. Did, did you mention me? Are, you are, did, did you want to say something? No, no, sorry, sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I just wonder if we've talked a little bit about indicators and, and maybe I've seen the messages from Anne Catherine and Jean Claude. It's, and Guto said that maybe there's an opportunity for, uh, for IANFI to move into that space. Um, so we've got another question uh, from uh, Haja, and I'm, apologies if I've mispronounced your name, just about how, do, how does the panel think that as national public health institutes, we can treat or prevent health inequities shift 
that is happening between developed and developing countries, particularly around climate and environmental change. And the example, really good example given around you know, transportation of refuge and garbage from one part of the world to the other. So what does the panel think about? What's our role? What can we do to try and raise awareness, prevent and, and address this? Guto, maybe I can come to you first. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I think I think this is a, a very very important question, and the, and the, is the is the, the first one is you see I, I try to demonstrate a little bit in the second part of my presentation. There are big challenges, methodological challenges there, and there are big inequalities in terms of a contribution for science. So I think engaging more uh, the uh, institutes from the global south giving more opportunities to develop you know, papers together, methodology together, and publishing together, that would be a huge contribution. I, I think this is the, the information that can come up from this, both in terms of the evidence, but the principle, uh, how you know, uh, evidence, how you can govern that, and how we can get a better dialogue between South and North, and how we can have a better dialogue South-South, that would be very, very important. So I think this is one point we can really act on as a, as a, a net network of institutes, very concrete point that we can do that. The second one I think is important is partnering with these other initiatives that's trying to move things on that way. And there are two, one is the advocacy, which is very important. We need to keep saying, this is happening and this is not good for the humankind. So we cannot, it's not, we cannot stop in saying that. We need to do that. And we do, to do that more specifically. Somebody make a, here a comment about the Lancet countdown and they need to be more specific. I agree 100%. So it's a great initiative in general, but we need to be more specific. We need to go in deep and demonstrate that more specifically where we can change it. And that's, uh, that's another important uh, thing. And they're going to the migration and the, the phenomenon we are seeing now happening everywhere. And there are, and which will be increasing because climate change is one of the drivers of migration. As you start having a starving and problems with food and problems with flooding, the people will migrate. And that's an issue that's totally, totally our work to do. We don't have actually much information about that. I, I'm trying to be working on this concept of human security, which includes some of the migration in that. And uh, even with, when you talk to the organization of uh, migrants and uh, discuss with them, when it comes up to the health problems and how you treat it, even for the main, most, mostly basic one, Health services, how you provide health services to migrants is not solved. The, the, the problems of violence in the camps of migrants is not solved. So the, 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 the problem with kids and the children, vaccination for children is not solved. So there are many, many questions about the migrants. And is a, is a big process. Is a, you know, a process between North and South and there's something you can work on that. So that would be my comment to stop here. Oh, thank you, Guto. There are, there are some probably you know, two or three really important shifts that are happening that we could, as a global public health family, really try and tackle and provide advice and address. Uh, I think that's really helpful. Uh, I, I'm going to just see if there's any other comments on this uh, question. Ingrid, thank you. And I, just to come in on that, again, I think that the the overlap between COVID and the situation we're in and the global inequities in, in vaccination, how can we use that? It's, it's again, the acute problem, but the more chronic problem that's so related behind that. And, and, and I think the awareness is there, you know, suddenly that's made everyone aware of how unfair the reality is. We're all getting our booster shots and others haven't even had their first shot throughout. I mean, we all know and we still continue. And, and it's the same, it's gonna be the same with climate change. And indeed, then you get a lot of migration, what is determining our politics and determining that other sense of insecurity around 
uh, Europe, where the populist movements are, <laughs> are, are uh, mushrooming everywhere and using that sense of insecurity and mobilizing. So, so again, it's, it's affecting the health of all of us. So, you know, there are no easy solutions. It's in the governance, but we're all in this together. <laughs> and, and if we don't start really mainstreaming that, uh, you know, it's not just a nice word and, and, and sector social over there, this is everything. Um, will continue with the insecurity. So I, I it, just taking it seriously, <laughs> again, no easy solutions, but it's, it's all interrelated and using the situation we're in now to really end the focus that is on health professionals, the, the, the voice box that COVID has given us to make that link um, constantly. Thank you, Ingrid. Uh, so yeah, I mean, as they say, it's a quite sobering conversations, but a lot of opportunities. I'm going to come now to, to, to before we close, to each of our uh, panelists and just ask one question and just asking just one sentence. If you were, what advice would you give all of us from all of your backgrounds? That it, what's the one thing you think we should do in order to embed health equity in how we address uh, climate and environmental change? What's that one thing you really think we need to be focusing on? So I'm going to come to Ingrid first. I think the easy answer for me is is the was in the the keep the triple win goggles <laughs> on. Fine, you know where are those co benefits? It's not always possible to find co benefits, but if we keep looking at it for a better future and you know the mantra of economy of well-being how can we move into use this as you know what we were doing wasn't working how can we use this crisis as a situation so it on the one hand sounds uh, cliche but it's <laughs> not at all we need to move forward with the vision of a better future with that well-being and triple win scenarios thank you very nice one great yeah, thanks. And, and I've also been thinking a bit more about the other questions that we got. A uh, lot of questions on indicators, but many of these questions refer to how we can compare across each other, compare across the world. And if you want true comparison, then it means that we need to develop the same indicators in the same way. So then my, my key question is, how do we achieve that? Um, and today we see that this is achieved through other organizations not through ourselves as national public health institutes. It is achieved, for instance, through the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. But is that what we want? Do we want to give this important activity out of our own hands and let other groups do the work of international comparability, global assessments, and not have a role ourselves in these processes? So maybe as IANFI, we can think a bit more about how we can collaborate and work towards truly comparable cross-national uh, standards and similar ways of doing the same things and having truly comparable estimates of, of equity, impacts, et cetera, et cetera. Thank, thank you, you. Grace. I think, I think that's excellent. Thank you. And thank you for that turning that question back to everybody as well, which is absolutely right. Thank you. Tatiana. Thank you. Um, in a few sentences, uh, I must say we should continue in terms of advocacy for this, for the health inequity, and even to provide more evidence uh, for the decision makers. That would be all. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that's massive in its own right, isn't it? Thank you, Tatiana. Guto, your final ask for an advice from you. I, I, you know, in journalism, you have this principle of giving the the voice for those who doesn't have a voice. I think that's a very good principle here. So if you need to really change things, you need to they give, they give it the science, the, vi the voice of science for those that doesn't have it. And I think focus on populations like the indigenous populations or the uh, uh, homeless population or the migrant population is, a, is something we can do that and something that for sure will impact the governance and we impact also the actions and the relationships. Thank you. Well, those four optics from the four of you uh, have really are about 
we get the practical elements of what we need to address and I think everyone will reflect on those so that brings our session to a close and just an enormous thanks to Ingrid, to Guta, to Tatiana, to Brecht and also to uh, Juliet and Louise for your support as well and Lisa so thank you ever so much really food for thought uh, and excellent content and thank you to the four of you for taking the time to prepare your presentations so I think it's a break for everybody now and then if people can return 30 minutes for the last uh, session of the conference so thank you very much everybody thank you very much for the excellent conference bye 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 thank you, thank thank you, you.